American made. Hey everybody, we are getting up and running here on Facebook and Zoom. Want to make sure everybody's popping into the Zoom room here. So just give us a second and we can get going with our introduction. So we are all up and running on the different platforms. All right, we are live. Hey, this is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So thrilled to have you with us here as part of our ongoing virtual author event series, which we have been doing since April of 2020 and have done roughly 200 virtual events in that time with so many different wonderful writers, authors, actors, cooks, poets, everybody in between. And it's been a really wonderful way to have a tether to you, our audience, and kind of maintain the level of programming that we were doing in the uh, before times or whatever we're calling them now. Um, but a lot of stuff coming up. I don't wanna go through the whole list of all the up pro programs we have upcoming, but you can go to our website, magiccitybooks.com and you can see the full uh, list of programs there. Um, we do have one in-person event this year left. We're gonna be bringing in a wonderful poet, Kate Bear, uh, who's got this new book out called, I Hope This Finds You Well. And she's a number one New York Times bestselling poet, which is not a common thing in 2020, 2021. So she'll be with us for a vaccination required mask in-person event, which will be a really special thing. So check the website out for details on that. And you can see all that fun stuff coming up. Um, so excited for tonight's event. Um, we have so much New York Times content tonight. It's almost like a de facto episode of the daily we've got going on here, uh, but it's really a special thing. And you know, one of the things that we love to do is kind of have this, you know, really varied offerings. I was saying it a little while ago, we've had everything in the last few days from, you know, the actor John Lithgow to a conversation with Oklahoma's own Anita Hill for her wonderful new book, Believing. And then today we're gonna get to talk about some really issues that are that are really uh, upfront in American life right now. You've probably seen this this underwhelming jobs report that came out last week and was causing a lot of uh, consternation. There's terms like the Great Resignation that are going on everywhere. You're seeing these kind of things pop up in this post-COVID working world and what that is what that world is like. And um, no one has been chronicling that more than Farrah Stockman, the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from New York Times on the New York Times editorial board, and this kind of gut punch of a book, American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. Um, the way that, that, that Farrah was able to, to follow the, the people in the book over the time and put in, invest the time with the, 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 the people that you'll meet in this project is um, pretty special. And you know, it's, you know we, I read a lot of books, you all read a lot of books, but when you can close the book and you feel like you've gotten to know some people just through the written word, that's a true talent and it uh, takes a, a, a real skill. So really excited about this tonight. I'm more excited for the fact that I get to be an audience member tonight, just like all of you and watch this conversation because we have a very special guest moderator, Kara Swisher, also from the New York Times, kind of podcast guru. If you listen to Sway or Pivot or all the a million projects that Kara has going at any given time, you know uh, what a powerhouse uh, we are lucky to have with us tonight, and uh, I've, I've been tempted to call us an evening with Farah and Kara, but it's just too, you can't, <laughs> can't go there, you know, we don't want You can do it, you can do oh, it. Can do it. Yeah. Okay, so a very special evening. I, most importantly, I want you guys to be asking questions, so if you do have some, we'll do some of that towards the end of the conversation, so please be putting those into the Q&A, and we'll get to those uh, toward the end, and of course, buy this book. Uh, we can make this book a bestseller here. We have our own bestseller list here in Oklahoma, which we publish every week in all the local newspapers around the state. And we want this book to be on that list, if not number one. So you can make yourself a really easy decision here by going into our chat and getting a copy of American Made um, and kind of get a real mirror to the world we're living in right now and understand America just a little bit more than you did before you opened that book. So very excited to have this event tonight. I want to say a big thank you to both Kara and Farah for joining us. Congratulations on the book, Farah. And I will turn it over to Kara. This rhyming thing, I'm just- Yeah, <laughs> well, we'll stop it right now. For this conversation. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. So I'm very excited to talk to Farah. Um, we've met, we met in person in Washington last week. Uh, I had never met her in person. Uh, and uh, we, she had a wonderful book party here. And some of the topics uh, that she covers in this book uh, on a very personal level with people right up close and personal are stuff I've been writing about around technology and the changing workforce. Um, and it's never been more clear than with the pandemic. Um, one of the things about this idea of the great resignation is that people are unhappy with their jobs. Either they're underpaid 
Uh, they don't have health care. They're terrible jobs. And everyone is rethinking everything. And where the workplace is the one place that that's going to happen. At the same time, it's colliding with big technological changes that is going to just change the workplace anyway. Um, it's it's it, and, and, and make significant changes in how we work and how we live. So I'm thrilled to talk to Farah, who's an expert on this. Uh, Following the tradition of a lot of books these days, uh, like Eli, uh, Eli Zaslow has a book on the pandemic, Andrea Elliott has a book on uh, a young woman she had followed. It's really effective when you start to cover people up close and as humans, because we've gotten so polarized over the past uh, couple of years. And it's really, to hear other people's stories is really important. So Farah, I want you to talk about how you decided to do this project and what you, um, what you were hoping to get out of it when she, you started and what you got out of it when it ended. Yeah, um, so I started covering these people. Um, I, the beginning of the book was literally election night in 2016. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing that so many, you know, tens of millions of, of Americans have voted for president a man who has never served even a single day in government. And that mm -hmm. was just stunning. Uh, I come from Michigan, I come from the Rust Belt. So I started asking around what made people vote for Donald Trump. And I kept hearing like, he's gonna save my job, he's gonna save my factory. And if you watch the, those rallies, he would, he would literally call out like, how many people are here from Carrier, which was a factory that was shutting down at the time. And they would just call, you know, they would raise their hand and he'd say, how many years were you there? And people would like yell out their years of seniority. This was like a big thing that hadn't really penetrated my, my world. Um, so at that point, um, I decided to follow workers at a factory in Indianapolis that was shutting down and moving to Mexico to really understand like, what does that feel like mm -hmm. to, you know, be told that your job is moving because these people over here are going to do it cheaper. I, I followed this woman named Shannon. Who, explain the factory, what it was. Explain. To oh, gosh. So they made bearings, which is mm -hmm. something that's literally in every machine that moves. It, it reduces fri friction. Mm -hmm. But most people uh, don't even know what a bearing is. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of, and, and that just shows you how different our worlds were. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how do you make it? What is it? What is the mm -hmm. machine? How does the machine work? Because I couldn't mm -hmm. actually go inside the factory. Um, but just to close the loop, I, I followed Shannon as this factory shuts down um, for, for over seven months. And I watched her like agonize over whether she should train her Mexican replacement or just or, or refuse, which is what the union wanted her to do. And she ends up having this bond with this Mexican young man that she trains. And at the end of it, he says like, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, and she said, I, you know, I was blessed to have this job and now it's your turn to be blessed. And I write, I write this story in the New York Times in 2017 and readers from like all over the world were like, tell us what happened to her. Tell mm -hmm. us how she, you know. Uh, how did she end up? Yeah, does she get another job? Where does she get another job? And there were all these predictions because every economist you interview says, oh yeah, these people are gonna get even better jobs than the job they had before. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to follow her for literally the rest of the Trump administration. And I also followed her coworker, Wally, who was a black guy and uh, John, who was a white guy to really just get us a, a picture of what happens to these people. And it was, it was really eye-opening. Okay, so talk a little bit. The factory had been there for how long? And again, a lot of these, some of these factories had closed. There's many of these stories previously, car companies, uh, you know, with trade deals, et cetera, et cetera. Why did this close down? Just again, the same trend towards globalization? Yes. So the bearing fact, the bearing business has been crappy in the United States for you know, a couple decades. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, bearings. Um, after World War II, the, the United States was a man manufacturing powerhouse and they made money hand over fist. Everybody wanted our bearings. Mm -hmm. And we had literally bombed uh, the bearing plants of Japan and Germany, which were their competition. And so, um, you know, it took a while for those to build back and eventually the rest of the world caught up and uh, were making cheaper bearings. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them with low quality equipment and, Anyway, 
it, it closed down because they could go to Mexico and pay workers in Mexico $3 an hour instead of $25 an hour in, in Indianapolis. And these were unionized jobs, right? Union jobs. Union job, they got health care, they got, pen, you know, they had pensions. So yeah, they were good jobs. So talk, talk about, so this set a tone, this has been something that's happening for decades, uh, the changes. And in some cases, uh, in technology, building um, phones and other electronic equipment in China, some things in Mexico, some things in India, but the manufacturing base has moved out of the United States. At the end, I want to talk about it moving back because there is a possibility of that happening. Um, but can you, what, this is not a new trend. So what happened in 2016? Because again, I can recall so many different stories like this over the years. What, do you, what did you detect that was different? Um, well, I mean, the Trump campaign was different. It was calling mm-hmm. attention to these plants. And, mm-hmm. you know, the decision to move that plant had probably been made a couple of years earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, comp- the factory had been bought by a, pri- a, a, a private equity company mm-hmm. that essentially took a giant loan and, and then, you know, sold it off. And now, you know, the basically left the company to pay off that giant loan. And anyway, um, I, I think private equity getting involved was part of it, but I also just think, you know, these are really hard shifts to, to move against. If you mm-hmm. have people who are able to work for $3 an hour, our economic system is set up to let them do that. And mm-hmm. NAFTA, NAFTA was the first trade agreement with a low-wage country that allowed, uh, allowed that to happen. And we've seen a lot of uh, you know, then came the, China's entrance into the WTO, and you just started seeing it a lot. All right. So talk about these individual people, because telling the story through these individual people, they sort of are always seen as this mass of people, and they're complex. And I think many people have been made reductive in this time on both sides. Like, some people are not reductive, but they're exactly who we think they are. But um, but talk a little bit about that concept as people being... Um, attracted to this idea of it's your fault it's someone else's fault and i'm here because of blank it's good to take advantage of well so she, i really wanted to follow a woman and <laughs> and the fact that there were women steel workers in this plant it, it i think it allowed my readers to connect a little bit more mm-hmm. um, she wasn't who you expected a steel worker to be and she was she had been uh an she had been in an abusive relationship and she ended up really getting the confidence to leave her abuser because she got this job in the factory and she worked her way up over 17 years. She started off as a janitor and ended up by the end, she was like running the furnaces, which is the most dangerous and highly paid job on the floor. Um, And so you could sort of see her climb in this factory and how all of the things, you know, the guys didn't want to train her and, and tried to get her fired. And, you know, you could just see that her getting that job was a sort of a, it was a a blue collar feminism. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there was sort of a gut punch when you, when, when you realized that as soon as she got there, boom, this is, this job is disappearing. Mm-hmm. And a very well-paying job, a high-paying job. In, in her case, she earned what every year? Because steel um, workers can earn a lot of money. Overtime. It depended on overtime, but it, during a good year, she could probably, she made like $68,000 and she had a GED. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, out there in Indianapolis in the service economy, people are making maybe $14, $15 an hour. So, <laughs> And there was a time when Rexnord told these workers, like, you guys are paid too highly. We want you to take a 30% pay cut, mm-hmm. and of which to which, of course, they said hells, hells to the no. Mm-hmm. And then, the, then the, you know, CEO started making plans to move the factory. To move the factory. All right. So what, talk about what happened without giving away everything in the book. But what were you looking for in their journey? Um, their frustration, the things you would expect, or what was surprising in each of these journeys? Well, so it was surprising to me how like personal the politics was because they literally brought these people from Mexico into the plant to learn Mm -hmm. the job. And Mm -hmm. once you learn the job, once once they learn the job, the machine that you operated would go to Mexico. 
and you would you'd be fired. And so it was like it was right in your face. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was like it it really gave like this visceral picture of why Trump had been so, why his message was so raw and resonating with, mm -hmm. with people, you know, they had, you know, I heard about graffiti in the bathroom, build the wall, you know, like these people were, they, you know, they saw it with their own eyes. Um, and that, you know, that was a kind of a, a really a shock to sort of mm -hmm. realize that this is, this is, this is what they're talking about. Cause I, and, and, um, I also followed Wally, who was a black worker. He was one mm -hmm. of the beloved workers in the plant. He um, he was also very optimistic. He believed in the American dream. He was one of the few who were, wasn't sitting around saying, "Oh no, I'm so you know crying mm -hmm. about the factory closing." He's like, "God closed this factory so that I could go and start my barbecue business." Mm -hmm. um, you know, for him, you know, I think because he had been black, because he was a black guy, he. He wasn't sort of under illusions that the company cared about him. Mm -hmm. he, he sort of, um, he just had more psychological resilience, uh, I, I felt. And so he was often walking around trying to get his white union brothers and sisters to kind of make plans for what would happen after the factory closed instead mm -hmm. of doing destructive things. And then the last guy I followed was John. Um, he was a union rep. This was his second plant closing. So he'd been through this before. Mm -hmm. The first time he'd lost everything, his house, his car. And so he was really looking to try to get that back with this mm -hmm. plant closing. And um, anyway, it was just fascinating how you could see these three people who are, you know, presumably you say they're, they're in the same economic situation, but actually they came from su such different histories that they really reacted differently to the plant. So talk closing. about the reactions. Talk about what, you know, overall and also individually. Because it's, it's essentially it foments a real restlessness among the population, as it did when we moved from farming to agricultural, agricultural to manufacturing. It was a huge wrenching and very violent time, too. Right. So for John, um, the he was this really diehard union guy. Uh, for him, he said we should all stand together and refuse to train. Right. Nothing against the Mexicans, but we're not going to train. We're right. not going to give away our knowledge. And he really tried to rally them all behind to this interracial worker solidarity, not to train the Mexicans. And right. he was very, he voted for Trump. He, he, he believed in Trump's message. He thought that maybe just maybe somewhere, you know, Trump might swoop in and save the factory, although he mm -hmm. would maybe deny it now, but mm -hmm. um and, the, you know, a, a lot of the Blacks in the plant thought that that was sort of, they were uncomfortable with the message of re refusing to train the Mexicans, right? Mm -hmm. They remembered it was not so long ago that white guys in the plant didn't want to train them. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, the fact that they had these racial divisions really, um, you know, they just, it, it was a very toxic and chaotic time friendships were destroyed like people people never spoke again best friends just never spoke again and you could see why you know you could just sort of see why why the country was tearing itself apart over trump and over over these sort of jobs moving so talk about those promises to for the changing workforce because i remember when they were going to um you know, coal mining areas and saying coal's coming back. And I kept thinking, no, it's not. Automation is going to happen. If, if anything, your bosses are desperate to replace you all with robots. They don't want to go to Mexico. They don't want to go anywhere. They want to do it here with machines. Um, and I remember giving a speech in Kentucky where, you know, they were talking about all the different things they could do. And I said, ah, this is all a lie. You're, you're being lied to by politicians. You're being lied to by people that you can change. You have to create a whole new industry. And I don't know what that is here. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think one of the things is being angry is an easier emotion than being realistic. Well, I think it's very tempting to say the factories are never coming, get back, get over it. When you live in the knowledge economy. No, no I get that. No, what I'm saying is that they, 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 that they were the way they were being told was not. Yes. This is never coming back the way you're told. I think manufacturing is coming back to this country, actually. But go ahead. But with high, without as many jobs, right? Yeah. Right. I think so. 
One thing I want to point out, because you hear a lot of talking heads on TV say, oh, it's not, it's not that we're offshoring jobs, it's, it's automation. And, mm -hmm. and, but when you really look at a factory, mm -hmm. they're not separate, right? If, right? if a company is competing with labor, cheap labor from overseas that pays $3 an hour and that can dump poison into the ocean with no, <laughs> no environmental regulations, right? If a company mm -hmm. is competing with that, the only way to compete with that is to automate. Yes. Just automate jobs away. So, so they're, they're not exactly separate, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And so I, I talked to the union guys a lot about automation and they had, auto, yeah, they had automated. They were constantly, you know, they were constantly updating their stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but, it, but it is true that American factories are just old, right? Mm -hmm. this, right. Built in 1959. So, you know, a factory that you can build from scratch with state of the art stuff in, you know, in another place, you know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be um, more efficient. Right, right. Is that the biggest worry when you were taught when you're looking at these populations that are, um, again, it did happen the lat when it went from farming to manufacturing. Um, there was a lot of stress on this on on the body politic on the society on people and a lot of anger. So what do you, how, I'd love you to make some links between those and then what do you, from talking to the people you did, how did, how did they move through it or didn't they? Yeah, I mean, I'll, if you talk, I have a friend who runs a hedge fund in Boston and he was mm -hmm. basically saying, this is no, no different than the original Teamsters who you mm -hmm. know ran the, horse, the horses and then yeah. they worked in the auto plants. This is just like that. Mm -hmm. um, but he also said, we're not gonna have blue collar jobs anymore. It's mm -hmm. over. We're, there's no more blue collar jobs anymore because manual labor will all be done by machines. And we just don't need these people to do that stuff. And so the, the only jobs that we're going to have for human beings mm -hmm. is going to be pink collar jobs, mm -hmm. the care economy, taking care of people and, you know, um, caring for the elderly or jobs that require creativity. This is, this was what he said. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're a blue collar person being told, we're just not going to have those jobs anymore. Right. Like it, is, it is central to their identity. Work is central to their identity. And so this mm -hmm. is sort of an existential crisis. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I think um, I, I'm trying to imagine all the college educated people being told, like, the colleges are gone and mm -hmm. never coming back and, right. and you know, get over it. It, I think it's, I, I think for some people, it's never, they're never going to get over it. Right. And, and I also think that um, there was, there was nothing about the manufacturing jobs that said they were going to be middle-class jobs, right? They weren't mm -hmm. middle-class jobs in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We right. had a labor movement that made, that made them pay well, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people died, fought and died for them to pay well. And so if we want jobs in the care economy to pay well, we have to fight for those jobs to be better treated, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, if you look at, you know, Biden's plan right now, that's what they're trying to do and, mm -hmm. and look how hard it is. Right. Um, so I, I guess, you know, these are huge shifts. And I, I mean, I push back a little bit on this idea that it's just inevitable because mm -hmm. these are choices, right? We were told that free trade is just inevitable. Globalization is just inevitable. This is a law of nature. But the pace of things, the design of it, and the way we treat people along the way, it, these are choices, they're policy choices, and mm -hmm. we have different choices. So talk about those different choices, because I think, um, uh, you know, I, I am a one of that it's just, it, this is just the way, everything that can't, I always say everything can be digitized, will be digitized. It's just, I don't, even including reporters. I, I mean, I'm not leaving anyone out. I'm not just saying line workers, but if you get yourself inside of an Amazon warehouse or anywhere else, you can see where it's going. You can actually look at it and go, oh, I see what this, what's happening here. Um, even though they, they hired a 500,000 people during the pandemic, which is an amazing number. They're almost, they're one of the biggest employers in the, in the, in the country. Walmart, I think remains the biggest employer at this point. Well, I mean, I have to say that these are, these are, this is part of why we're seeing such inequality and part of why mm -hmm. we're not going to have a democracy because you know the Elon Musk idea that we're all just going to live on universal basic income and you know mm -hmm. he's going to give us all a check uh, 
that's not a democracy, right? Like mm -hmm. countries where the population live, first of all, it makes Elon Musk too big to fail. And, mm -hmm. and second of all, you know, look at countries where people just receive money from the government instead of paying mm -hmm. taxes. Those that's like Saudi Arabia, right? That's mm -hmm. not not a democracy, right? These are right. people, people pay taxes and then they ask for, they ask for stuff from their government. They want right. accountability. That's what a democracy looks like. Sure. And so we're moving away from that. I will say that, you know, you say Trump can't turn back the clock and, and you're right, he can't, but I haven't seen Joe Biden put back the right. Chinese goods. I haven't seen that. And mm -hmm. I don't think Joe Biden's going to do it. Like, right. and it, it's not just it's not just America. Look at Brexit. The working class people in industrialized democracies are sick of their jobs going elsewhere, mm -hmm. and they're actually rebelling against globalization. They want mm -hmm. this, they want walls and tariffs. And if we don't want to give them walls and tariffs, then we have to come up with a better solution. So, so talk about that solution, because one of the things that's, uh, you know, there, there's an idea of a splinter net, like a, th that things do get manufactured in different places. But the first part, before we get to that, I want to talk about unionization, because one of your characters is a union person. Yeah. The weakness of the unions has, has been really rather startling. Can you talk about that um, and why? Yeah. And what do they have to do to change? I think well, about this a lot. There's a lot of. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons the union's weak. And one of them is that once globalization started happening, right? Mm -hmm. you, people started begging factories to stay, mm -hmm. right? So unions for, for decades, they were fighting for better pay. They were fighting mm -hmm. for the weekend and all the, you know, and all, mm -hmm. all, all this stuff. And then they got it and they had a middle-class they had a middle class life for white men, and then you know, women and black people fought for that for those same things, and then the factories start going overseas. Mm -hmm. And so, as soon as that starts happening, you lose your leverage. You mm -hmm. you you can't now you you don't see people. You, those there was very little appetite for striking in that plant, very mm -hmm. little, because people were just um, they were. They, you know, if you work in a factory in, a, in the United States today, you're just hanging on by your fingernails. Like mm -hmm. you're not, you're, you're, look at companies are like throwing money at, 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 at or municipalities are throwing money at companies to try mm -hmm. to get them to come. Like um, the Amazon warehouse. Yeah, I mean, we've turned, we've turned into beggars. It's the yeah. opposite of striking. And so, right. you know, I think, I think globalization has totally undercut the idea of unions, because if, if a company can just say, get out of pay, labor laws and environmental standards by going uh, to a country where they can- Or a state. Or, or right. But if they can just leave pick mm -hmm. up with no right. consequence, then you're out, you're, you're done. So-, so I, I What think happens then in that situation? What happens to the unions? Because it, it, the, the pandemic seems to be the best things that's happened to workers, even though it's a horrible tragedy, because sure. now people are like need, in need of work and people had money. We had, you know, relief money and people are like, I'm not going back to that crappy job in retail or that restaurant job or whatever, where I had low pay, low benefits and, you know, problematic workforces. When I saw the union in that plant, I went to a union meeting. That, there were like maybe five people there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and almost nobody who wasn't sort of uh, uh, elected as a representative to be there or paid to be there. And, and mm -hmm. like, you know, handful of people. Um, so yeah, they were in a death spiral. If, mm -hmm. you, if unions can't get their members what they want, um, then people stop stop believing, believing them. And, right. and then it's a political death spiral because then they don't vote for the things that protect the people who protect unions you get republicans mm -hmm. in office who then put you know uh, uh right to work laws and which had just passed in indiana in 2012 mm -hmm. so um yeah it's a death spiral so i don't think i mean i think you are seeing um unions come up in different parts, like graduate students are, are unionized. Mm -hmm. We're seeing like- yeah. Internet, uh, internet writers, yeah. Do domestic uh, domestic workers um, mm -hmm. might unionize. So you're seeing it come up in different parts of the economy, but I think in manufacturing, people are just, they're tired of living constantly in fear of losing their job. 
Mm -hmm. And so what happens? What replaces it? Because in now in the pandemic, there are jobs everywhere. You can see signs at every restaurant, uh, every one I talk to, whether it's crab pickers in Maryland, you can't buy crab cakes because there's not enough crabbers or 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 people in a rest. I, I think I've gone to dozens of places where like we can't do that because we don't have enough workers. Right. And what does that mean? Uh, the question is really whether people are just living off their savings now and mm -hmm. in a couple of months they will, the savings have run out and then they'll just come back to, mm -hmm. you know, they'll be forced to come back. I mean, they have to live off something, right? And um, and it's not gonna, the savings are not gonna last forever. Right. So I don't, I don't think, I think, you know, I think we've turned off the, the, the a lot of, 75% of people I've read were earning more. Shannon earned more than, more, during the pandemic when she was sent home than when she was when than when she was working. So so, yeah. so talk about using these characters. What what was your greatest fear talking to them and spending so much time? Uh, did it make you hopeless or or did you see a, a changing workplace that's going to be better someday or not? Or not I of the above? Really felt, I felt I felt more hopeful in a way because I saw that here are real people, some of whom supported Trump, not all of them did, some supported Bernie, but, but they, they're not total QAnon jerks. Mm -hmm. Like I, they are, there was a logic to it that I could empathize with. Explain that logic. So for even people. though, even though, even though, uh, you know, I disagreed with it and I think Trump is terrible for our, for our democracy in so many ways, I understood why people, Trump had literally tweeted about their factory. Make, mm -hmm. you know, he tweeted about, Rex, you know, Rex Nord, he made them feel seen. And, uh, you know, that no politician had done that. These people were incredibly cynical about politics. They called, mm -hmm. you know, both parties were crooks. You know, a lot of them had never voted in their life until 2016. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was something I felt I felt more hopeful than some of my friends in Boston who had never had a conversation with people like this. Because I mean, to me, a big takeaway is that there's a huge disconnect between people who have college degrees, people who have education and what the economy has for them, right? You can work from home and you can work in the knowledge economy right. and, and what the economy has for people who just stepped out of high school or don't even have a college or don't even mm -hmm. have a high school degree. There's the, the jobs for them are, are pretty bad and and you're you're competing with the hungriest workers in the world right and around the world globally yeah so yeah. what when you, you you mentioned by the 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 different infrastructure bills and all the different bills that are passing is there what needs to be done we're going to get some by the way if you have questions for Farah, uh, make sure to use get uh, the q a uh, button here um, but what do you, what are your, what needs to be done? I mean, did you come to any conclusions or is it just, here's their stories? I think uh, two things. One is that work matters. Mm -hmm. work, people need jobs. They, they, they want to work. And I think uh, even if it's a, even if it's a low dose of work, <laughs> a yeah. few hours uh it 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 matters it's a social life it's connection and you see bad things happen when folks lose their jobs in mass you see mental health crises you see um you see opioid uh, uh overdoses mm -hmm. we lost 90,000 people in 2020 from opioid overdoses mm -hmm. and that was a 30 percent increase partly i think it's because you know, we know that employment shocks do that. So people need to work and, and the working class, the folks that I talked to, they saw their job as what separated them from, you know, the people who live, who live off the government, who live off system <laughs> they didn't pay into. It's a, it's a real point of pride. And I think people need that. Shannon was super depressed after, after she lost her job and stayed unemployed. And the longer you stayed unemployed, the harder it is to get a job. So I think we need jobs and we need to make sure that even if, even if it is the civilian conservation corps or whatever, people mm -hmm. going out and, and restoring trails and the government paying you to do that, it's better than the government paying you to do nothing because right. you're at least, you're being connected and you're serving a purpose and you're feeling useful. I think that that's important. And two, I think 
college educated people who happen to make all the decisions in this country <laughs> need to reconnect with those with those folks who don't have a college degree who happen to make up two thirds of American adults. Mm -hmm. There's a huge disconnect between those of us who make decisions, policy decisions, and those who have to live with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just think we really, you know, so even when you talk about build back better, sell this plan better. You know, mm -hmm. politicians on Capitol Hill are all talking about free college, but what they should really be talking about, which is also in the bill, is apprenticeship programs mm -hmm. that help people get into the trades. Like that's in the bill too, but they never mention it. And that's well, two, <laughs> one thing you you sort of quickly dismissed was um, UBI, which is I think an interesting and big idea. I, I tell me you you look, you made a face there. So you know this is something pushed by uh, Andrew Yang and many others. It's not just him. A lot of people in tech are pushing it for sure. Um, what is the problem you see with that? Because it, it, it's it's meant to relieve people of constant stress and worry. It's better than nothing. Yeah. I think it's better than nothing. And I think that, you know, in this in this in this grand debate over where we go from here and mm -hmm. whether, you know, whether we put up a bunch of walls and tariffs and have a protectionist economy or whether we say open it up, but just, you know, know that we're going to give UBI to all the people who are going to lose their jobs, which is pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I guess the, my two problems, it's better than nothing and I, I don't wanna poo poo it, but I think not everybody is going to survive just that kind of dislocation and, and, and disconnection. Mm -hmm. If you're really, if you really don't have a place to plug in, you really don't, I mean, you and I would probably find stuff to do mm -hmm. um, and, and there's volunteer work, there's churches, mm -hmm. there's lots of stuff people can do. But right now, you're like people spend a lot of time at work. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. And that is where they get a lot of the meaning in their life. And I worry that they, I worry that um, about what happens when people are unemployed. And we just, we see really bad, we see really bad results when mm -hmm. large groups of people in a community don't have a job. All right, talk a little bit about this idea of the gig economy, because that's something I do write a lot about. And it's obviously the Ubers, the deliveries, huge boom in these jobs. Yeah. No benefits for the most part. Now, there's some states, like California, fighting, although they lost recently. Um, but the I, I remember having a discussion with Gavin Newsom when he's lieutenant governor. And he, he said something that actually at the time struck me. This was maybe eight, nine, ten years ago. And he said, we need to, there's no such thing as an employee anymore. We've got to redefine what a worker is in terms of moving okay. healthcare. And it was very early. And I remember being 100% yeah, right. right. And then of course, gig workers came into force. Um, can you talk about what that means? Cause that, like now people are gonna have 20 jobs in their lifetime versus I don't know, six or seven or whatever the old number was. Again, compare it to the days of the union where you fought to have that institution give you a share of the profit and mm -hmm. all, and, and you know, more, more time off, more free time, more money. That was the fight. And that, and as soon as those things were won, companies figured out how to shed those things. As soon as, as soon as we said, okay, companies have to give people health care, companies started saying, well, now you're not my employee. I don't have to give you health care. Right. So yeah, it's a way, it's a way out of giving people um, part of the part of the profits and mm -hmm. I don't see it going away but it, you know not everyone is built to be an entrepreneur and mm. um you know all the uber drivers I talk to are on their way to becoming something else it's not a mm -hmm. career. it's not something you do forever and you, you know you ruin your car you do you know? yeah I mean, health if you're not if you're sick you can't yeah but I will say that that Healthcare was a big takeaway from these three stories. Healthcare mm -hmm. was huge. And it, it's one of the reasons it's deadly to lose your job in this country. Mm -hmm. because your healthcare is tied to a job. And so if we're moving towards a, a place where people are gonna have 20 different jobs, we need to have healthcare that is not tied to our employment. I mean, um, so one of the things, the last thing, I'm gonna have some questions, please put some in. There's one or two already in there already. Um, when you're thinking, one of the things you mentioned is this inequality is not a democracy. Um, something I was talking, you know, the, they happen to be tech people because in the during the pandemic they've risen their value of their wealth. I think Elon's has uh, now is now has the GDP of Hungary. In, added, added, not 
before. Yeah. Can I, can I, uh, no. <laughs> it's complicated. Anyway, um, they've become richer than ever. They've and by a fat a large factor, the companies have been more value moving into the trillion dollar range from several of these companies. Um, I want you to talk about income inequality because one of the things I had said was I was watching this trend and I wrote about it in the Times, especially among tech people, because that's who who are really benefiting and, and, and shareholders, the same thing. I said, you can do something about this inequality and, and try to stabilize it in some way. I'm not sure there's probably 20 ideas to do so. Or you can armor plate your Tesla. That's your choice here. You know, like you can do that, but you're going to have to, if you don't, you're going to have to armor play your Tesla for, for, and live behind walls and live, you know, away from people in, with people in fear of each other. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about this, this, this glaring income inequality? Because it's really quite, the numbers are quite staggering at this point. Sure. Well, so right after I published my piece about Shannon, Mm -hmm. a, a rich New York lawyer paid off the mortgage of, on her house. He oh. read the story, he was touched, he paid off her house. And it was like, it was almost like he was splitting, he, he, he did it with his friend, they each paid half. It was almost like two men splitting a deep dish pizza. Like mm -hmm. that's how much money they had and how, you know, the, it, they could just, and so I, I asked him like, is, is there something wrong with the system itself that, you know, you, this is one person, but think of all the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he didn't have a great answer, but he did say like, look, you know, I'm willing to pay, you know, half of my wealth mm -hmm. or half of my income, right? I'm willing to pay that to keep America running and to keep people housed and whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know people who, who aren't no. and they, they move overseas. And so- Or Texas, like, that you see an exodus from California to- Sure, sure. But I mean, there's the, in, the I make a distinction though, when you move out of the country, Mm -hmm. it's it's a challenge to our system globally right now we have a system based on nations that make laws taxes mm -hmm. and all these things tell us how 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 we should you know give back to our community and our society what do we owe the least mm -hmm. but if you can just you know give up your citizenship move up move overseas and rich people are increasingly doing that mm -hmm. right i mean it's you know, they're more powerful than governments because yep. they don't have to, if there's a rule that comes around that they don't like, you can just leave. And I just think that that's part of why we're, we're, we're feeling what we're feeling right now. It's part of the toxic politics. And it's part of the reason people said, okay, we're just, we don't need a democracy anymore. We don't have a democracy right now. Just give us a king like Trump who can who can be benign to us. And, and they're not looking for democracy. <laughs> they're, they're looking for a savior. So I'm gonna ask you a last question then we're gonna get to questions. But one of the things I remember talking about is that you have this uber wealthy group of people who've gotten richer than ever. And they're at the very top. It's, it's even yeah. the 1% of the 1% kind of thing. But they're very wealthy into the richest people in the history of the world really. And that includes Cleopatra, okay? Or Julius right. Caesar or whatever. Sure. Yeah. And you have people on the bottom who are, uneducated or badly educated, bad nutrition, mired in addiction, um, not been trained and stuck there in this place in the mud down at the bottom, right? And then you used to have this middle class in the middle, the working class, the middle place that would pull people up and pull people up. And this group is not pulling people up anymore. This group is getting squashed. How do you, how do you recreate that system? Because there's no pulling up of people from beneath you, which is what happened for a long time. It's not only just that there's not pulling up, now they're squabbling over a shrinking pool of good jobs. So there's there's a shrinking pool of good blue collar jobs right now mm -hmm. or in the factories. And um, that's what it exacerbates racial tension. That's what mm -hmm. creates, you know, exacerbates xenophobia and mm -hmm. fear and hatred of immigrants because mm -hmm. You've, these are these are people who are saying you're com you're coming to, to do my job cheaper after mm -hmm. I you know after I spent decades trying to mm -hmm. get to where I am at and uh, it's you I think that that's why we're seeing so much of this toxic toxic you know race race competition race racialized language I, mm -hmm. I just I worry that. Um, 
it's all these people, you know, it's, it's people in the middle who are, who are, who are facing that competition squeeze. And, yeah. You know, and the folks at the top are just, you know, it's like yeah. that movie with Matt Damon. Do you remember yeah. that? They were flo- the rich people were floating above and the poor people had to scrabble. On them. I mean, the, the reality is though, that Shannon, Wally and John had far more in common with each other than they did with the CEO. Mm-hmm. And they had many more interracial relationships and friendships with people on that factory floor than the than the corporate mm-hmm. than the corporate guys, right? The corporate guys are almost all a bunch of white guys. I think there were two Indian guys, but like it's it, they're they're not getting called bigots, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? right? The corporate guys aren't getting getting uh, getting called names. Mm-hmm. For, for, for that. So anyway, I, I guess I, you know, it was very eye-opening to see how, okay. how, how, how that could Let's happen. get to some, let's get to some questions. We only have 10 minutes from the audience. Um, Jeff, do you want to say them or do you want to, uh, me to read them? Yeah, I'll just throw them. Cause I think some people may, you might have, both of you may have a response mm-hmm. to this. Um, so we'll begin with a question from Amy uh, Farah, who says, your title gives honor to William Julius Wilson's classic book, when work disappears, how do you feel like your conclusions differ from or build on his findings from so many years ago? Oh, I definitely feel like I, I, I build on his findings because what he showed is, you know, how disorganized a community can become when they lose their jobs, right? When, when it's not just one family that loses the jobs, but the whole block, the whole community um, gets, gets sicker and weaker and, 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 uh, when people don't have that example of folks getting up and going to work. We know that's true about urban America in the 70s. But what I'm saying is it, it's also true about the Rust Belt and some of these communities that lost their factories uh, uh, you know, in more recent years. Um, so I definitely feel like I'm building, and I did write to him and, and talk to him about his conclusion. Um, this next question is from Forrest, uh, I think applies to both of, you, both of you would like to respond. It says, I'm a high school teacher and the discussion has touched on the educational divide that separates people from access to the work from home slash knowledge economy jobs. What should those who work in education be training their students for as a college degree and tech slash creative job the only answer? Terry, uh, I have a, a theory, but I, th- I, I hate the way we teach people. I think it doesn't teach them, prepare them for team building and problem solving and everything else. I think it's rote memorization. I think we give uh, some people better versions of it. Um, the rich people get a better version. But as the pandemic has shown, um, every, even the, the top to the bottom had very bad experiences with, through this pandemic. And creating a real a new way to think about educating people and not just like let's make them plumbers or let's make them this it's the idea of of group team building and growing and even though you said uh very not everybody's an entrepreneur everyone's going to have to have an entrepreneurial side to them i think in the future uh because if you think about it farmers are entrepreneurs there's america has been full of people who are that we we always stick an entrepreneur they look like mark zuckerberg that is not true your barbecue guys of an entrepreneur, everybody, you know, teaching entrepreneurism can be done in a way that is not always tech oriented. It's thinking about things. Um, if you provide them with safety underneath too, at the same time, that's what we do. We say, be an entrepreneur and then there's no safety net underneath them. I, I would build on that and say, you know, a lot of just basic life skills, like compound interest, mm-hmm. people don't know. Like, yeah. you know, Shannon uh, went to try to pay off her car once she, uh, once she got this windfall, couldn't, you know, couldn't understand why she owed so much. Um, so some basic life skills math wise are not being taught, but I, I, yeah, I don't think everybody uh, wants to go to college uh, or is, um, I just think a lot of blue collar people push back on this idea that they have to go to college and pay a bunch of money to get a piece of paper to know anything. A lot of those people have huge skills. They have a lot of skills. And just because a college educated person hasn't credentialed them doesn't mean that they don't have something to give to society. So what do you think about these new credentialing systems by Google and others? This is an interesting trend. I 
I know a lot, I know people who have decided not to go to college, but have instead pursued some of those, you know, so those computer credentials and they've done well for themselves. And I think that that's a great model. Um, some of the credentialing, you know, smacks of higher education um, institutions are trying to survive by like, you know, blessing the knowledge of, of, of others that, but, but I think in general, that's, it's the way to go. I think some, you know, we don't need a one size fits all education system and we've got to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question that uh, kind of follows up with that line of thought, which is from Pearly, who says, based upon your following the lives of these factory workers in your book and others, what do they feel are viable alternatives to depending and hoping that factory and mine work would be revived? You know, what do they feel could be a viable option to that work? Well, healthcare is the new factory. Everybody I ever met in Indianapolis who had any ambition wanted to be a nurse. And John ended up working maintenance in a hospital. And he literally was like, do I want to be a steel worker again? I get, I, or I'll earn a little more, but it'll it'll be in a factory that I'm not sure it's going to last. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of people are going into healthcare, but how many people can healthcare fit, right? Like it's it's um, it, it's uh, it's a, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I'm just wondering if Pearly is my aunt Pearly. <laughs> how many can there be? How many can there be? A great name. Um, um, uh, let's have a few more. Yep. So this is from Amy, who says, uh, this is for Farah. Did Farah look at the 21st century manufacturing apprenticeship and re retraining programs that President Obama funded via the U.S. Commerce, including in Indiana and West Virginia, where Senator Manchin uh, still fights for the coal industry? Yeah, I, I looked into it a little bit. I do think Obama didn't get enough credit for um, the way he tried to champion uh, manufacturing. And there, there is a, a resurgence of American factories that are sort of newer, more automated, and that is kind of the future, I think, as you are. It's called, it's called advanced manufacturing, like Gorilla Glass for iPhones. There's a lot of very interesting new technologies around manufacturing. They're rethinking them in ways that are very, and will require quite a lot of workers, actually. Oh, some, well, some, 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 uh, some plants are, don't seem like they have the same, quite, they don't need the same quite a number of people. Um, I mean, this is bipartisan. I think Obama talked about it. Trump talked about it. Biden talked about it. There, you know, the idea of my sister's an engineer. She um, builds machines and there's a lot of times she can't find somebody, she can't find a machinist, right? Like there are, these are skills that we need here in the States and, and, and they're valuable skills. We wouldn't have won, we would not have won World War II had we not had people with skills like this. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the next war is gonna look like, but um, you know, I, I, I'm glad we still have people in this country who know how to do stuff like this. And I hope, I hope we, we keep them. Um, this is for Kara specifically, uh, mm -hmm. referencing something you mentioned a little while ago. This is from Judy who says, Kara, what is your view specifically about manufacturing coming back to the country? You mentioned it and said mm -hmm. that you thought it would. So what were you saying there? Well, as I just said with Ferris, there's some really interesting things that technology companies are looking at doing in manufacturing um, around uh, like advanced manufacturing, uh, where they really do want the finest quality stuff and they can find it here um, and they can do it for a, a pretty good cost for themselves like Gorilla Glass. And so Apple, for example, is funding quite a few. When Remember Trump said, oh, Apple's opening up a new factory. They really weren't. They were re retrofitting a factory in order to create all kinds of things. He, he made it up essentially, but it wasn't untrue. Apple was pushing for a lot more manufacturing in the US. Um, the other thing that's interesting that's happening is that it's not just... Um, it's going to be in lots of different things. I, you know, you mentioned coal. The only thing I was just talking, my family's in the coal business a long time ago. And my brother was pointing out that uh, suddenly Bitcoin, which has been barred mining, Bitcoin mining in China has been barred by that country. Um, coal is being used to do Bitcoin for energy for Bitcoin mining. So he's like, we're selling a lot of coal to Bitcoin mining. And I was like, what? Like, it was really fat. I never, that, that was not on my bingo card. Um, but it requires a great deal of energy. 
Um, they're, they're looking for ways to do it in a clean way because a lot of people who are within the industry are trying to cut energy costs down, but that was really interesting to me. Um, and then I think what, one of the things is this, um, uh, there's a lot of smaller entrepreneurial efforts in really interesting areas like uh, cars. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this country um, that are going on around um, self-driving cars, uh, clean energy, clean energy, clean tech, uh, and it's all here. It's, it's all over the world, but it's, it's a lot of stuff happening here in this country around that. Um, and then space, um, of all things, we have, you just saw William Shatner go up today and thankfully return to earth. Uh, that could have been a disaster. Um, but um, th there's a lot of very interesting innovation happening in space and rocketry. And, and there's a lot of machine jobs. There's a lot of jobs that are not, you don't have to have a college degree. Um, and then lastly, I think the idea of a college degree is changing. And the, the idea that we need, I, I think universities the way we have now as, as if you know they, 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 they're thrilled when they have a 2% acceptance rate, that's appalling. It should be 70%. It should not, you know, Harvard shouldn't have a, have a uh, Harvard shouldn't have so much money and then brag that they only let only a few people in. If they have that much money, they should educate more people and give people degrees. I think that's going to change really drastically and then allow people to move up in different skills. Um, it's not the college degree per se, but it's moving us more flexibly into the next economy. Um, this is from Davida for Farah. It says, can you talk about how we have to be very careful when we're creating policy? I'm an African-American woman and what I know is that the Civil Rights Act greatly benefited college educated white women who joined the professional world, who grew rich on economic shifts and black women who had blue collar jobs had their jobs swept away. Great question. Yeah, Sarah? that's, I, I, I wrote, a, I wrote a, quite a bit about that, yeah. Um, I mean, affirmative action, the Civil Rights Act, I, I mean, it did benefit people to a point, but um, we know that the biggest beneficiaries were college educated white women who, who, who are, tend to be married to college educated white men. And they, are, they do pretty well, they do pretty well for themselves. So um, it's, we, it's, a, it's still a struggle and I think, um, I think we need to do a better job of uh, talking about the needs of blue collar people um, and, and, and creating multiracial political coalitions that can fight for changes that will help everyone. I mean, I have relatives in, in Detroit who have two master's degrees and they're struggling to, to, to make ends meet. Um, with it. So it's, it's not also just the blue collar folks. Um, if, if you're a black woman with two master's degrees, you still might have a hard time getting a job that pays you what, even what you were earning five years ago. And so that, that's the economic reality. We, you know, people are seeing their wages go down not it's not even just flatlined it's going yeah. down yeah. and that's the economic reality for huge numbers of people uh today and it's you know if uh, you, can i just add to that if you had to pick a policy right now obviously they're arguing over all these bills if you had a magic wand you could say this is the policy that we should pass right now what would it be in this area or any area you want gosh well that's what democrats are having to do right now right, right. There's, yeah but you're 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 the <laughs> Emperor, the king. I, think, I, you know, I, I thought the build. I was a little skeptical when I first started looking at the Build Back Better plan, and the more I dug into each bit of it, I thought, yeah, this is what we need. This is what we need, and I, I, I think, um, I think we need a lot of things all at once, and and I, 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 I hope that they're able to get more of it passed because. Um, they're talking about taking uh, laid off blue collar workers and getting them not to mine coal, but to electrify um, our, our vehicles. Make, we need a fleet of electric vehicles. We need charging stations. We need to transform our economy into a, into a climate safe economy. And that's, that, those are blue collar jobs. Mm -hmm. Those are blue collar jobs. We can make them paying jobs. The cost of that plan, by the way, is less than the cost of the Afghan war. Mm 
So, I mean, I kind of feel like we should say, yeah, we need to make America great again. Pay for that. That's the way to do it. Like, yeah, we need to put Americans first again. Sure. Put them first, you know, hire them to, to make our um, economy uh, an economy for the 21st century. Like we can do this. And I, I just think there has been a lot of good thinking uh, and we need to give them a little bit more credit. And a lot of things in that plan are bipartisan and they're things that even Trump supported. So I, I just wish, I, I hope that they'll, they'll be able to, to, to do it. Electrification, you know, that's gonna make Elon Musk richer, just so you know, just oh. FYI. <laughs> well, um, everyone else can benefit, it's fine. My final question is just from something I ask whenever I get an opportunity to talk to, to smart folks like you. And it's um, uh, every time there's a presidential cycle, um, you hear about kind of a return to the thriving middle class of the post-war era. And it's always kind of the thing people throw out as an example. And when you think about that time period, it's really post-World War II, and you could say it started to kind of fade in the Carter administration or up into the Reagan, but it was a very short period of time when people kind of think about that, that, that kind of magical window of the thriving American middle class. In the history of our country, that's a blip. Do you think that, one, that's ever achievable to get back to that, and two, is the kind of default of capitalism, the income inequality that we have here. And in some ways, that's always where it's going to kind of fall back to unless it's moderated out. Yeah, so essentially 100 million lords and 300 million serfs or whatever, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's certainly the conclusion that uh, a lot of people, smart people are coming to who have written thicker books than me. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a great book called The Great Exception about those years. And um, I, I do think there was a lot that was exceptional about that time and including the historically low immigration rates. So, you know, we don't, we don't talk about this a lot because it's, it's, it's a sore spot for, for liberals. But, you know, when you have more people coming in who are willing to work for far less, uh, that also undercuts the idea of high wages and, and the high wages that unions had fought for. So um, I don't know how you have all those things at the same time. I don't know how you can have a huge safety net and make it, and high wages and make it accessible to everybody who wants to come and, and get it. Um, but uh, we can do better than we're doing now. We can, and, and other countries have done better. If you look at Germany, they they had a plan. They they have they have unions sit on corporate boards in Germany. They they you know in high school you can get connected to a company and you're not just going to to school. You're also going to do internships. There's a lot more preparation for high road, you know, manufacturing jobs in in Germany, and they've done a, a better job than we have, frankly, at planning for what their blue collar workers will do. In the United States, it's just like whoo you know, yeah. sink or swim. <laughs> and it, it, it hasn't worked out so well for a lot of people. So are you going to keep following these, uh, these three people? Well, uh, <laughs> I think they're, I think they're tired of me my down. <laughs> so I, I actually have a, you know, I, I was in touch with a lot of them today saying, can I, can I mail you a book? And, um, you know, I'll, I'll always check in on them. But to me, they were closer bellwether. There are a better bellwether of where the American people are than my own friends, because they, you know, most Americans don't have graduate degrees. Um, and I think most Americans, they were, they were predicting, um, you know, reactions and to elections. They were, they were just giving a, a rawer and more real prediction than, than the folks that I hang out with. I love you all if you're watching, <laughs> but um, yeah, just uh, so I, I do intend to keep in touch with them and uh, and see what they're thinking just to, you know, get a little glimpse of the future. Great. 
Well, thank you so much. Uh, you want to take the, over, Jeff? Yeah, the, the book is American made. Um, the author is Farrah Stockman. We've had such a great time. We've barely scratched the surface of what this book mm -hmm. contains. And so I would encourage all of you to take the time to get this book. We're going to make it easy for you right there is a link again to get a copy of this. Spend time with it, get to know the people that, that Farrah introduces us to. And I want to say a big, big thank you to Kara and to Farrah for joining us tonight for this conversation. And I hope everyone is uh, safe, take care, and thank you so much for watching and joining us. Thanks, Farah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks everybody, for tuning in. Bye. Bye.